Next on C-SPAN 2, we take you to the National Press Club in downtown Washington, D.C. for coverage of remarks by actress Julie Andrews. She discusses her work as a representative of the United Nations Development Fund for Women. Ms. Andrews has taken several trips as a goodwill ambassador for the organization and discusses refugee women and children and worldwide poverty. Here now is the program. Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Greg Spears and I'm president of the National Press Club and Washington correspondent for three Knight Ritter newspapers in Florida, the Tallahassee Democrat, the Braden Herald, and the News of Boca Raton. I'd like to welcome my fellow club members and their guests in the audience today, as well as those of you who are listening to this program over one of more than 400 national public radio stations or watching on one of the 4,200 cable systems affiliated with C-SPAN. Before introducing the guests at our head table, I would like to remind our members of some coming speakers. On December 17th, Michel Camdesou, the Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund, will discuss the World Economic Outlook. And on January 15th, comedian Jackie Mason will join us. <laughs> Audio and videotapes of Press Club luncheons are available through the National Press Club Library or by calling 1-800-952-TAPE. I'd also like to remind our guests here today that if you have any questions for our speaker, and I know that you will, please write them on the cards provided at your table and pass them up to me, and I will ask as many as time allows. I'd like now to introduce our head table guests and ask them to please stand briefly when their names are read. I also ask the audience to withhold any applause until I've read all their names. Beginning at my left and your right, Bill Eaton of the Los Angeles Times. Nancy Dunn of the Financial Times of London. Sandra McElwain, a freelance writer. Betty Cole Dukert, senior producer, Meet the Press, NBC TV. Hope Miller, president of the United Nations Development Fund for Women. Skipping over our speaker for the moment, Christy Wise, who's the member of the National Press Club Speakers Committee who organized today's luncheon. Sharon Capelling Alakaja, director of the United Nations Development Fund for Women. Danielle Harubin, Washington Bureau Chief for the Orange County Register. Julie Moon of the U.S. Asian News. Miss Adam Ulogam of Radio Television De Mali. And John Price, Entertainment Editor of Knight Ritter Tribune Newswire. For Julie Andrews, her roles in film of a loving, caring nanny in The Sound of Music and Mary Poppins parallel a similar compassion in her life outside the movie house. Spurred by her desire to bring the world's attention to difficult conditions facing women in developing countries, the actress and singer has accepted the position of goodwill ambassador for the United Nations Development Fund for Women, known as UNIFEM. As she said in March upon accepting her appointment, quote, I am a woman who has had extraordinary privilege and good fortune. I have the right to be free, explore my own potential, and to vote. I feel this is a time in my life to help others, less fortunate, have those same opportunities and choices. Those opportunities began for Julie Andrews very young. The daughter of British music hall performers, she began singing at age seven when she and her parents traveled around wartime England entertaining troops and boosting civilian morale. As an adult, she first appeared on Broadway stage in 1954 in The Boyfriend. She moved into film in 1964, starring as the governess in Mary Poppins, and a year later appearing in a similar role in The Sound of Music. Since then, she has starred in numerous films where she has not played the role of governess, such as Victor Victoria. <laughs> Among her many honors has been an Academy Award for her performance in Mary Poppins and a Lifetime Tribute Award from the British Academy of Film and Television Arts. Miss Andrews will return to the New York stage this March in the Stephen Sondheim Review, Putting It Together. 
as, you, you, as a UN goodwill ambassador, Ms. Andrews has met with women in Jordan, Senegal, and most recently, Japan. Asia is a particularly familiar part of the world for Ms. Andrews and her husband, Blake Edwards, who were active in bringing wounded Vietnamese children to this country for treatment, and who they have adopted two Vietnamese girls of their own. The goal of UNIFEM could be described, she said, as creating many ripples from dropping one pebble in a pond. In her words, quote, the thought being that if you help, let's say 400 women, then you automatically help about a million children and their relatives and families. It is my pleasure to welcome to the National Press Club, Ms. Julie Andrews. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. President Spears, distinguished guests, friends of UNIFEM, such a wonderful gathering of people who have come to celebrate the Year of the Woman in the United States and the work of UNIFEM worldwide. Both the Year of the Woman and UNIFEM represent something vitally important, and that is the process of empowering women. Women's commitment their energy, creativity, and competence have finally won them a greater role in the political life of the United States. And now, women in developing countries are emerging as leaders in remote villages and urban shanty towns. They're winning a voice in the decision-making structures that shape their lives. Like women here, they are beginning to claim their right to build the future. I agreed to serve as UNIFEM's goodwill ambassador because I was impressed by its clarity of vision. Its many projects help women to build a better life for themselves and their families. Its development work at the grassroots level has a powerful effect on the communities in which these women live. I, as uh, President Spears said, I am a woman who has enjoyed privilege and good fortune. I was born in a safe and friendly place I do have the right to vote, to travel, to be free, to explore my own potential, and many other things. I take some of these things for granted. One should never do that. Everyone is aware of the need for the advancement of women in developing countries. Over one third of the world's households are sustained by women. They run 70% of all small businesses, and in Africa, they produce, process, and market 80% of the food consumed. Women contribute so much to the economy of their countries, but they are often ignored by the policymakers. Uh, they're rarely properly represented in any uh, delegation, to my knowledge. It is women and children who suffer the most when their country runs into economic difficulties. Poverty amongst women is increasing faster than ever in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. The number of rural women in third world countries who now live in poverty is estimated by the United Nations to be 565 million. That's a 50% increase over the past 15 years. These women are the ones who are involved in food production and income generation, so UNIFEM concentrated much of its support on agriculture, food security, and small enterprise development. On my first trip as UNIFEM's ambassador to Senegal earlier this year, I saw how difficult local conditions are for women, appalling. But the women of Lubudu village, for instance, no longer have to pound their millet by hand. With the help of a grinding mill supplied by UNIFEM, they have reduced five hours of blistering work each day to a mere five minutes. Until recently, one of Lubudu's women, 50-year-old Aminato Diallo's day, began at dawn with the milking of a handful of goats. This was followed by a long trek to find neighbors willing to swap their millet for her milk. She would then walk 14 kilometers to and from a village which had a grinding machine. And on returning home, she had to collect wood and water before she could even think of preparing the family's one daily meal. This is a routine for millions of African women. 
Aminata told me that Unifem's project has made a big difference in her life. Lubudu's new grinding mill has saved her a long walk. Now she can afford to buy a sheep every six months. The tremendous energy, dignity, and courage of the women I met in Senegal. Unifem has made a great difference in their lives. Now they're able to redirect the time that they use to spend in domestic drudgery to activities which generate income for the whole family. A revolving loan fund set up by Unifem also makes cash available to villagers for housing and community improvement. An area of Unifem's effort, perhaps closest to my heart, is their work with refugee women and children. In 1982, I visited Vietnam, Cambodia, and several refugee camps along the Thai border, and I was particularly happy when UNIFEM began, in conjunction with UNHCR, to address the very special problem of refugees. Today, there are over 15 million refugees worldwide, 75% of whom, 75% of whom are women and children. One out of every three of these refugees is African, and they spend years in camps initially meant to be temporary havens. The problems of both refugees and hosts have become long-term ones. Until recently, disasters were treated as separate short-term events, but as we continue to witness mounting personal tragedies, the unraveling of rural society, we can no longer afford to take the short view. It has to change. Disasters disrupt development. The current drought in Southern Africa is draining public resources, development projects are shelved, and needed social services cut back. Do we give emergency aid in a manner that is empowering, that mobilizes people's talents and energies, or in a manner that sustains dependency and passivity. UNIFEM cannot be a major funding agency for refugees, but by directly supporting select demonstration projects that empower women refugees, UNIFEM can positively influence mainstream refugee programs. Drought stalks Africa, but its economic toll on long-term development prospects is greater among the 11 nations at Africa's southern tip. Recent rains have helped a little, but you don't reverse the economic effects of severe and prolonged drought in a day or a week or months. Rivers and lakes have dwindled, crops have shriveled, and dead animals litter the countryside. People are on the move in a desperate search for water and food that undermines regional stability. Southern Africa risks losing its post-independence economic and social gains. Without international assistance, the drought may trigger permanent economic crisis. 30% of Southern Africa's 115 million people are directly affected by the drought. About 3.5 million risk death or severe malnutrition, especially in Mozambique and refugee-swollen Malawi. The drought cuts food crops by 40 to 80 percent. Zimbabwe and South Africa, both normally breadbaskets for the region, have lost more than 70 percent of their food crops. Roughly half of Zimbabwe's 10 million people have applied for drought relief. Crises often overwhelm people's capacity to cope. UNIFEM wants to help the most vulnerable, women, refugees, and the displaced to take action before things unravel even more. For that reason, UNIFEM has asked me to announce the launch of a special appeal to assist women in crisis in Southern Africa. And please remember that if you help women, you automatically help three times that many children and their families too. We are seeking one and a half million in new funding from individuals and governments to allow us to respond more flexibly to women in this afflicted region. UNIFEM has already identified several activities to provide emergency aid described in the folders that you have in front of you. These activities will have a developmental impact. When I visit Zimbabwe for UNIFEM in 1993, I hope to see some of them in operation. Help 
UNIFEM reach its goal as quickly as possible to make a real difference in women's lives. Most women, as workers, wives, mothers, heads of families, are charged with the task of solving food, water, health, and educational problems. They are the custodians of traditional values important to developing cultural identity. As refugees, deprived and in danger, women continue to play this role, but with little or no support. We must begin by looking to these women. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Ms. Andrews. Our first question today is, what do you consider the biggest problem facing women in developing nations? Yes, I will. I would like to introduce you to the director of UNIFEM, Ms. Sharon kapling Alakia, who was going to help me answer some of your questions today, because as far as statistics go, she's a genius and I'm an amateur. So, Sharon, what would you say are the, are the most pressing? Well, I couldn't have got all these people here either. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that um, it's, it's a very difficult question because, uh, and it's an important question because I think there's two levels that we, that we need to operate on. First, um, there are major obstacles that women come up against in their daily lives and these are called their practical needs. And this includes everything, the things that uh, Julie mentioned in her speech from water supply and sanitation and health and education and uh, even basic education such as literacy. Um, there are more women, uh, there are more women in, uh, who are illiterate today than there were 15 years ago in absolute numbers. And the gaps between women and men uh, with respect to literacy and education and income continue to widen in all developing countries. So these are basic and very uh, pressing and very important um, needs for women. But there is also, I think, another level, and that is at the strategic level. And by that I mean at the decision making um, and the, the level of power. Um, women do not participate uh, in any significant numbers in the political process in most developing countries in all regions of the world. They do not have a voice uh, in the decision making uh, of their societies and they do not have an opportunity to shape the, uh, the uh, decisions that are ultimately going to shape uh, their lives. And I think that uh, we must work at parallel levels both to uh, meet women's strategic needs while at the same time meeting the very, very basic practical um, needs that they confront in daily life. Don't leave. <laughs> <laughs> I won't. <laughs> News reports have made clear that the death toll from AIDS in Africa and other developing continents is going to be truly horrific, something that hasn't been seen perhaps since the Black Death. What is UNIFEM doing about AIDS and how can that problem be successfully fought? Um, the tragedy of AIDS in Africa as a, an, an overlay to an already um, deteriorating condition for uh, this uh, poorest of continents is, is very significant. It is a problem that I think a small organization like UNIFEM can only play a very small role in, in addressing. Our total budget is $14 million. Were we to put our $14 million in even one country to try and take on the issue of AIDS, we would not even scratch the surface of the problem. However, um, AIDS plays a particularly uh, tragic role for women in that continent because um, in many parts of the continent, women have very little control over their sexuality, which means that they are exceedingly vulnerable um, and they uh, are really uh, left um, in, in many cases uh, helpless and without choice. In fact, the only choice for many African women is in fact to leave the home. 
so that this is a, a very important uh, issue with respect to the dimension uh, that and the particular problem for women. And our effort is really on this area to, to do some advocacy work and to align ourselves with the larger organizations of the UN system, particularly the United Nations Development Program and the World Health Organization, who are pouring millions of dollars into AIDS research and into AIDS education. And our job is to bring the gender dimension to their efforts. And I'm happy to say that um, uh, the United Nations Development Program has leading its HIV uh, program in Africa, one of the world's experts on uh, on this subject, Elizabeth Reed. And so UNIFEM is working very closely with UNDP on this issue and supporting her efforts um, to to educate women of the of the dangers and to also work with governments to begin to institute policies because of course there's still a huge as in even in this country a huge denial yet that uh, of the enormity of the problem if i could just uh, follow up the united states government for many years has made it a policy to refuse support to family planning efforts internationally in especially in developed nations should this policy be reversed by the incoming Clinton administration? And if it were, what would that mean for women around the world? I think whatever happens uh, in the United States, because um, of its, uh, uh, it's such a, a central co a country with respect to international communications and, uh, uh, and the media, and because it is the world power, is extremely important. And so the, signal, um, that the signals that come from this country are very, very important. And that is why I am uh, I'm happy to uh, hear that, in fact, one of the first statements that was made by the new administration is that that policy will be being reversed. And I understand funding will be uh, forthcoming to the United Nations Population uh, Program early in, in the new year. So I think that that, uh, that policy is changing. And I think it's very important for those of us working on women's issues to um, see the United States uh, take a leadership role in this area because um, I think it sends very positive signals uh, globally. Ms. Andrews, if I could ask you, what is your future role going to be in UNIFEM? Will you participate in fundraising? And uh, also, you mentioned you've visited several nations, and what have you discovered uh, on your trips? Um, well, my, my role really is to uh, make people aware as I'm doing today, of the beautiful symbol that, that uh, UNIFEM, uh, the, the, the wonderful sort of uh, emblem that is UNIFEM. I'd, I'd like, if I had my way, to make it as uh, important as, let's say, the uh, five rings of the Olympic Committee or, uh, or the symbol of, UNIFEM, of UNICEF or any of those wonderful uh, organizations. And uh, hopefully that will happen um, a little bit with my help and certainly with UNIFEM's work. Um, I, of course, will participate in fundraising if I can. Uh, I will speak on its behalf and just really raise awareness and consciousness. Um, there's a lot of talk which hasn't completely uh, crystallized yet about what we will be doing in the future. I will travel on their behalf. Uh, I want to see for myself firsthand. I, I don't like um, spouting a lot of facts and figures and not really uh, uh, and not having experienced it myself. So I like to try to get out there and see for myself what it is I'm talking about. It somehow puts a different light behind your eyes. And uh, I, this, this year, I only signed on with UNIFEM in um, February, March, but I did go to Senegal and I have been to Japan. I opened the UNIFEM uh, uh, wing in Japan and uh, I also was in Jordan seeing some of the work that they do there. Um, Senegal probably was the biggest trip that I made, and it was certainly very moving. I spoke about it in my speech. Um, it is extraordinary. Uh, the, the thing that, that probably people have said, what, what um, impressed you the most? And it is that there is a sisterhood between women. And if you sh reach out and shake a woman's hand who is completely illiterate, who has no idea who you are, who has never met you before in her life, who cannot uh, have water in her home, who has a whole bunch of children around her, who has to do everything in the house. And when she took my hand, and many others too besides, and there was a complete understanding of who we both were and what our 
what our hopes were for, for us women. I, it's very hard to put into words, but it is something that touched me deeply because I knew she knew, she knew why I wanted to be there, and it was deeply moving. And I found it on every level, not just with this one lady or with all the other ladies that I met, but way, way up in government, there was a need to stand around and talk and a need to listen, um, a need to, to, to further this wonderful thing that we're all trying to do, which is to empower women, uh, especially in the devel developing countries and in the rural communities. So it was, it was very moving and, and wonderful. How have you been received by the governments in the countries in which you've visited? And do they show any intention of extending that power to women? Well, there are a lot of uh, promises made, and, uh, and, and hopefully just by pressing and, and pushing for it and being there and um, using my face and my, my you know, I, I am fortunate in that I, I am somebody that is known and I can use that little bit of muscle. Um, they've been extremely cordial, um, and I've tried to be most tactful. I'm very new at this ambassadorial work, so I'm constantly terrified I'm going to put my foot in it, but uh, so far I haven't. <laughs> I'm curious, uh, do the women you meet in Senegal or Jordan or uh, developing nations know you as an actress? Um, Yes and no. Uh, um, uh, some, sometimes people had no idea who I was, and that's absolutely fine and correct. And other times there were some hilarious moments when... Uh, uh, what was the time when there was this huge, huge banner that said... Oh, yes. Uh, Julie Ann Drews. Yeah. D-R-E-U-S. That's right. <laughs> Welcome. Yes, J-U-L-I, A-N-D-R-E-U-S. So I don't know if they knew who I was or not, but... <laughs> This is something of a technical question. Will the anticipated reversal of the U.S.-Mexico City policy be a help for women around the world? And can you explain what the Mexico City... That's definitely yours. City <laughs> Oh, is that a blank? You're drawing a blank? I don't even know what that part is. We're going to skip that question. <laughs> Boy, am I glad she's with me today. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have an, another trip planned overseas? Yes, uh, as I said, I'm hoping to go to Zimbabwe uh, in 1993, and I also, Sharon and I have talked a lot about going back to Cambodia, um, and I would very much like to do that. So it's just a question of working out when we can go, and uh, there's a lot of trips planned, but uh, it's when they slot in for us both and, and, and our own fairly busy schedules. You want to talk about that? Well, I just wanted to say that uh, Julie is one of the world's great traveling uh, partners because uh, she is uh, she was being very modest because most places that we went, uh, people of all ages knew who she was and were thrilled to see her. But I have to tell you that uh, here I was traveling with Julie Andrews, but every morning uh, while we were in Senegal, I get this knock on my door and guess who was bringing me a pot of tea? Uh, <laughs> I've never had such good room service. A <laughs> uh, questioner says, Unifem sounds like a high flyer stock on Wall Street. <laughs> Tell us what it really is. Uh, you've, I said its budget is 14 million. I assume it's headquartered in New York. Uh, and just could you tell us where your outposts are and, and what your major goal is? Boy, I wish we were a high-flying stock, and maybe, uh, maybe uh, we will be one day. Uh, UNIFEM uh, is the United Nations Development Fund for Women, and it is a very special organization because it, in fact, belongs to women. It was really women, and many of them, in fact, are actually in this room. I recognize some of them who were sitting in the hotel rooms and in the lobbies and, uh, in, and finally in the podium of the World Conference in Mexico City in 1975 who pushed and argued and said we've had enough resolutions and rhetoric, we want some results and some resources for women, and they created a fund for the decade. Um, that fund for the decade in 19, uh, 1985 took on the name UNIFEM and uh, had an extended mandate because, of course, 10 years was not quite enough to reverse some of the uh, inequities that women all over the world are confronting. We have two major thrusts to our work. One is to directly support the economic activities of grassroots women in developing countries 
And the second part of our mandate is to change the policy environment in which development decision making is done, both so that uh, the activities of women uh, will flourish, the grassroots activities of women will flourish, and I think uh, as importantly that women play their rightful role in participating equally with men in the decision making and in shaping the structures that will shape their lives. So that is the, the major thrust of the program. UNIFEM, as I say, has been around since 1985 under the, under the name of UNIFEM. I'm the second director of the organization. I assume my responsibilities just about four um, years ago and feel immensely pr um, uh, privileged to be the head of the World Organization for Women at this time because I think it's a very important uh, juncture for the history um, of both the United Nations and I think for the history of women within the United Nations. And so I'm very proud to uh, be very much a, a part of that and, of course, absolutely thrilled that we have such a marvelous and uh, uh, committed goodwill ambassador in Julie Andrews. For Ms. Andrews' uh, question, tell us your personal experiences while traveling on behalf of UNIFEM. What impressed you or affected you the most? And uh, do you feel that, uh, that you're making progress? It seems, in all honesty, to be slow work. Um, I, I, I'm impatient, and I would like it to be faster. And and better, and I, I, I um, when the um, Somalia crisis was begin, beginning to really hit the newspapers, I remember I was in uh, London, and I had this fantasy that I would go out into Hyde Park and stand on one of those speaker's boxes and, and just <laughs> yell and say, come on, women, we can do it. Uh, everybody else seems to be at a standstill. Let's just, and I wanted to fax Sharon and I wanted to say what can we do what can we do because it seemed it wasn't happening fast enough nothing seems to happen fast enough and I think we all feel helpless about that and hopeless but um, but I think the fact that you begin to do something about it, it it grows and grows and hopefully as I said a drop in the bucket becomes a large bucket and then it becomes an ocean uh, it's all sort of platitudes but it, it's true um, things that impress me most I think I've already addressed things like this these wonderful women who who um, who had such an understanding in their eyes, the extreme degree of poverty, the enormous amount of illiteracy. It is extraordinary. The, the statistics of illiterate women worldwide is, is what, uh, um, Sharon? It's, it's enormous. Yes, as a genius, of course, I should have that right here. Yeah, but, uh, but it's, it's something like one-third of... Yes, at least one-third of the world's it, women. It's, it's something like one-third of the world's women, not just the developing countries, but one-third of world's women are illiterate and, and it's it's staggering and I'm hoping that that the world will become more and more compassionate more and more unified I think it's everybody must feel that it's trying so hard to change we're all struggling so hard to find out who we are and where we belong and what our countries are made up of I'm not very smart at this kind of talk I'm not at all political I'm humanitarian but uh, but I hope that, for instance, this wonderful thing that the United States is doing going into Somalia, I hope it breeds some kind of high, because humanitarian work does breed a kind of high. You come away thinking, I, I maybe changed that much, and it, it, it makes you want to go on doing it. And I hope that what we're doing in Somalia makes all of us feel good, that for once it's not killing and, and militarily bashing people about, but, but actually helping people survive. And uh, I hope it breeds a lot more of the same. Enough said. We've made notes here today that UNIFEM was established in 1985. And yet, Ms. Andrews, you mentioned that in 1982 you were visiting refugee camps in Asia and that uh, you helped children uh, who were injured in the Vietnam War before that. Uh, how did your interest in this uh, international outreach grow? Do, can you specifically be specific about what interested you. Well, I think uh, um, everybody at the end of the war with Vietnam was, was concerned and wondering how they could help also and feeling rather helpless. Uh, there was a group in California called the Committee of Responsibility that uh, ordinary concerned citizens and doctors and surgeons who would bring in 
wounded children who absolutely had no chance of help in their own country. Children uh, who were the victims of a sniper's bullet or napalm or things like that, who couldn't get in the hospitals in then Saigon, couldn't get the help that they needed. And my husband Blake and I were part of that committee and we became acquainted with those wonderful children. Uh, subsequently, we adopted two Vietnamese orphans and then um, one of the other uh, big organi organizations that I support is um, a small international relief agency called Operation USA, Operation California USA. And uh, it does wonderful work and I was traveling for them on that visit you mentioned to um, the border camps. I wanted to see for myself how the aid got delivered and I wanted to see the, uh, I wanted to learn a little bit for my own children's sake, but I also wanted to learn for my sake as well. So that's how it sort of grew and I became more and more involved. And um, one of the amazing things, uh, I, I've seen it written in some of the newspapers, uh, I had this terrible embarrassment about looking in on people's misery, look, walking into the uh, refugee camps in, on the Thai border. I had this feeling that I had no right to lift up a tent flap and look in on someone's extreme agony and poverty. And I felt somewhat embarrassed and apologetic for being there. But what I learned was that people are so thrilled that somebody bothers to come and see for themselves. They don't just write about it from afar, they actually come. And they were so happy to have people there to come and bear witness. And I had never thought of it that way. Um, it helped put me at my ease and, and I found it very touching. Before I ask another question, I'd like to recognize in our audience today Senator Nancy pa Kassebaum of Kansas, uh, who is an honorary co-chair of UNIFEM, and Representatives Constance Morella and Representative Jennifer Dunn of Washington State. Thank you for joining us today. And I think this is a, an appropriate question given Senator Kassebaum's presence. What can someone in Topeka, Kansas do to help? <laughs> Let's stop having uh, Somalias. I think that um, the world waited too long. And I think one of the reasons why, I believe one of the reasons why UNIFEM is now raising the whole question of Southern Africa is because uh, there are at least 10 or 12 countries across Africa right now that have many of the same elements um, that preceded the, the crisis, that, uh, the unraveling that uh, ultimately became a Somalia. We need to move now. Well, people still um, have their uh, people still have their uh, dignity, their communities, and so on, so that we that there is a structure and a, uh, a community with whom we can work and not allow these situations to deteriorate to to a point uh, where there is anarchy because there just aren't enough Marines to go everywhere. So I think we need to take action now. I guess if there if there's someone here from Topeka, Kansas, uh, Senator Kassenbaum, um, and Anybody, uh, uh, one, we would like to see the United States uh, government increase, continue to increase uh, its support for UNIFEM. We would like to see um, a more development approach uh, be taken with respect to relief. Uh, we would like to see women. Uh, the refugees themselves, 75 percent of the refugees are women and their children, more involved in the management of the refugee camps, in the distribution of the food, and in beginning to take up um, uh, positions within the management of these refugee situations where they can develop the skills that are portable and can take them home. So get out your checkbook and send a check to the UNIFEM National Committee for the United States. Um, the address is in the folder that uh, you have before you. Um, also support people in, in Congress and in the Senate who are raising the issues of um, development because I think right now we are looking very much inward. All the economies of the industrialized worlds, uh, world we know um, are going through their own form of structural adjustment, but this is not the moment to look only inward. I think we must also remember that we have a global responsibility, all of us, and that if we, um, if we do not go there to solve the problem, the problem will come here to us. So I think it's very important that we begin to work 
uh, particularly, I think, focusing world attention on Africa, which um, is the country, a, a continent that is really in crisis in almost uh, from north to south. For those of you who are watching or listening and don't have the pamphlet, the address, I'm told, is 252 North Washington Street, Falls Church, Virginia, 22046. Or you can call, and here's an 800 number. This always makes me sound like, sound like Jerry Brown. 1 800 982 9781. It was recently in the news that uh, U.S. women in Saudi Arabia who are stationed there with the military are being asked not to drive automobiles, that this is an off offensive to the culture there. Do you foresee any improvement in the status and freedoms of women in the Arab nations? And if so, will this be any time soon? <laughs> Go on, Jim. <laughs> this is what I get paid for. Um, I think that uh, the United Nations Development Program uh, puts out a publication annually called the Human Development Report. And in the Human Development Report, countries are ranked by a number of indicators uh, with respect to um, human development that involve basic income and literacy, health, and longevity. And uh, although um, most of the uh, Middle Eastern Arab states uh, rank quite highly in, in World Bank statistics on GNP per capita, uh, with respect to issues of human development, the, uh, these uh, countries drop quite far uh, down, the, down the scale. And the gap, of course, between men and women uh, in these countries is quite wide. And for that reason, in fact, we, UNIFEM, will be uh, strengthening its own programming capacity uh, in that region. I think uh, it must be done in a way that is, recognizes and, um, and acknowledges both sovereignty and cultural sensitivity. But sometimes the notion of sovereignty and cultural sensitivity can also um, be a finesse. And I think that we have to be very careful that there are some values that are universal, that um, transcend um, both culture and sovereignty of nations. Uh, at the end of the 19th century, uh, the world came to a consensus that it was no longer acceptable for one person to own another person, and we stopped slavery. Um, by the end of the 19th century, almost all countries in the world had agreed that this was no longer an acceptable practice. Now, culturally and traditionally and sovereign and in within sovereignty, this had been practiced for, the, uh, for uh, centuries. But a universal value began to override that. And all I would like to see is that as we approach the end of the 20th century, we may be reaching a point where one gender doesn't dominate another, that in fact men and women share both responsibility and the work and the creativity um, of our planet. And I hope that uh, that is uh, certainly what UNIFEM hopes for, and I hope that you share that hope with me. I'd like to shift gears now and ask, there's two questions for Julie Andrews along the same lines. My daughter, Elizabeth, is 11 and loves the performing arts. What advice do you have for her and other people considering a career in this field? And then a similar question is, have you any advice for beginning actors like my son? And this is signed with a frowny face, not a smiley face. <laughs> I think it's, that's a very hard question to answer. It's, it sounds like such a simple one, but there are, the chances of success are so rare in this business, and I've seen so many disappointments. However, I've seen so many extraordinary, fabulous, lucky breaks and miracles. And I guess if someone's child is truly passionate, then it seems an awful shame to stifle that passion. And uh, I would encourage it. Uh, who knows? The child will find out for itself whether it's really dedicated and wants to continue. But don't stop it from learning to sing or act or dance or write or draw or whatever. Because I think it, anything in the arts is, is worth doing. Um, and for people who are really committed and have gone further than that, I think I would say there are always 
there is in everyone's life, except of course with the people that we've been discussing today, who don't seem able to get up off the ground for being pushed into it, but for us lucky ones, there is always a moment when a wonderful opportunity passes under your nose. And all I can say is I think you better damn well be ready when it comes by. Do your homework, uh, young children, and be prepared because those chances will, for you, in this wonderful country, certainly, and in the uh, better places in the world, it will happen. And just be ready because uh, that's when you can seize the opportunity. Here's something that's been bothering me a long time. How did you fly in Mary Poppins? <laughs> Well, I could be coy and say, wouldn't you like to know? <laughs> I have to practice very hard. Um, in actual fact, Disney, um, Disney did it every which way so that the people watching the film couldn't see how it was done. Uh, they, they obviously flew me on wires. They obviously turned the set sideways so that you wouldn't see which way the wires were. When it was filmed head on, the wires, in fact, would look like they were coming. Uh, it's hard to explain. <laughs> they, put me on teeter-totters and, and uh, um, uh, any number of things, stuck me on top of a very high step ladder and so on. And there's one wonderful story about, they saved all the difficult stuff, the really dangerous flying stuff, till the very, very end. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that if I got dropped or if anything happened to me, they'd got, got most of the movie anyway. <laughs> and um, I was hanging way up in the rafters of one of the sound stages one day, and uh, I f was it, it, very painful to be in one of those flying harnesses for a start. And because it was the end of the movie, I was tired and I was nervous. And I felt the whole flying rig, the whole thing that was holding me up, give about a foot. And it, my heart turned over and I thought, oh my God, I'd think that whoever's managing me down there is not terribly uh, aware. Uh, and uh, so I said, listen, uh, when you bring me down, could you bring me down really carefully because I don't feel very safe. Now, the, a flying rig, uh, there's me on this end, and it goes up to a whole rafter, and then it goes all the way along and is uh, balanced by weights at the other end of the studio, and somebody manages those weights. And so the word went way down the studio, when she comes down, take her down carefully, Joe. Take her down carefully when she's about to come down, Joe, at which point I fell. <laughs> and uh, I just simply plummeted, and uh, happily, because there are weights and balances, uh, my feet were about this far from the floor, but of course I went straight into the floor and said a few Anglo-Saxon words, which I don't often say. <laughs> and um, there was a very long pause, and a voice from the back of the studio just said, is she down yet? <laughs> and uh, he was never heard of again. <laughs> uh, someone has sent in two questions in the same vein. Who was your favorite leading man? And was, and was making the sound of music as much fun as it seemed? Um, all the leading men that I've been fortunate to work with have been darling. I, there hasn't been a curmudgeon, there hasn't been a bad-tempered one, there hasn't been anybody that I haven't loved working with, and all for different reasons. Um, uh, I couldn't honestly say. Um, each experience brings its own memories and pleasures and so on. Uh, and the sound, uh, what was the one about the sound of music? That was it as much fun to make as it seems to want? Yes, yes. The only thing somebody didn't tell us was that Austria has the world's high, seventh highest annual rainfall. <laughs> and so we sat around for days and days and days while we were waiting for the sun to come out. But in fact, it was to our advantage to some degree because it gave the film that wonderful puffy clouds look. Uh, it wasn't all just peaches and cream and sunshine and, uh, and um, sparkle. It, it did have a kind of moodiness about it which helped the look of the film enormously. But it was fun to do. The littlest kid was extremely heavy <laughs> and uh, uh, I was always the one that had to carry, carry her and things like that. <laughs> but the kids, in, the kids were wonderful. They're, it's really mind-boggling. It's We've had our 25th anniversary, and every 10 years or so we get together and have a reunion. And of course, the littlest kid was seven, I believe, when I worked with her. And the first reunion, she was 17, and sort of Marilyn Monroe walked into the room, and this was her. And I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. She had a bosom out to here, and uh, <laughs> just looking knockout, and this was our little girl. And uh, we're all very great friends still, and I adore Robert Wise. Uh, yes, it was a happy experience. 
Are you and your husband, Blake Edwards, planning any future films together? What are your plans uh, for your career in the future? Is there a part that you desperately want to play? No, nothing that I desperately want to do. Um, uh, I just hope that for a few more years I'm allowed or asked to do as much that is as varied as possible because that's a great sort of turn on for me. I love doing different things. Uh, having said that, I also love doing musicals because they're so joyous. Um, uh, Blake and I, my husband is one of those people who, who has six ideas a week. And so um, I never really know what we're going to be doing next because he can change his mind or the studios um, like one thing better than another. So we do have a lot of things on the drawing board, um, but I don't know what they will be in terms of films. We are hoping, um, and it's in work at the moment, to come to Broadway with a musical of Victor Victoria, which will be great fun. And uh, I don't know when that will be, because as I say, it's being written as we speak. Um, uh, I think that answers your question, doesn't it? <laughs> Yes, another question for Miss Andrews. Don't you find it amazing that Unifem accomplishes so much with so little? Yes. What's the total annual, annual expenditure? Yes, I do find it amazing. Uh, that's one of the things that impressed me so much when I went to uh, Senegal and into the, way, way into the uh, sub-Sahara desert and, and to the village of Lubudu. Um, uh, the women had managed to do so much with actually a not tremendously large uh, budget uh, donated by UNIFEM. Uh, the, the annual budget at the moment is 14 million, but we keep hoping that, that governments will donate more and more each year. Uh, Sharon, isn't it true that, 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 that each country in the United Nations, they, they all donate a certain amount? Yes. As your budget? Yes, UNIFEM's funding comes from two major sources. The first is voluntary contributions of governments. And so uh, every November there is a United Nations pledging conference where um, uh, governments uh, make their annual pledges uh, for various organizations of the United Nations, and UNIFEM is one of those. But we also um, receive money through, we have national committees now in um, almost 20 countries around the world, and in fact, uh, Julie Andrews inaugurated our most recent national committee in Japan on the 24th of November when she was doing a concert tour in that country. Um, so that the national committees around the world also raise resources uh, for us from private uh, donations, from corporations and from individuals and foundations. And we also receive significant contributions from uh, major international women's organizations, and particularly Zonta International and Sir Optimists have been uh, very generous in adopting UNIFEM projects. So those are the key sources. Our funding, uh, we are gratified, I think, that our funding has been gradually re increasing even in this difficult time, and, and we very much appreciate uh, that support we're getting opportunity to thank the United States because the United States increased its contribution to UNIFEM by 25% um, for 1993. So we would like to say thank you to all of you who pay taxes to the United States government and thank you. <laughs> well, we've heard about uh, the effort overseas to help emancipate women. Uh, when will you turn your attention on the United States? <laughs> Well, UNIFEM's mandate is to um, work with women in, in developing countries, but also to be a bridge between women in the North and in the South. Um, as some of you may know, 1995 will um, see in the fourth uh, World Conference for Women. This conference will be held in Beijing, China in September of uh, 1995, the last conference being held in Nairobi in 1985. And we are hoping that this will be a moment for the world's women to gather in Beijing to celebrate um, the uh, carrying out of many of the um, strategies that were, were um, uh, put, put into place uh, in Nairobi in 1985. I'm sorry to say that with respect to many of the indicators, uh, the news so far um, is not so good. But I think it is an opportunity to, uh, for women in the North and South 
to um, begin to uh, join hands and work together for um, a better world at both the family and community level as well as, as at the international level. And UNIFEM will be involved with other United Nations organizations and governments in preparation for, I think, a very, very important world event in September of 1995. We do not work directly with um, women who live in poverty in this country, but we do fund some women's networks such as grassroots organization, um, uh, the grassroots network called Groots, which does have members um, from uh, slum areas in, in uh, American cities and Canadian cities and other parts of Europe, as well as grassroots women in the South. So we do support some of these, these uh, important women net women's networks who are trying to create understanding. Before I ask the last question, I'd like to present Ms. Andrews with a certificate of appreciation from the National Press Club. Oh, thank you. Thank as, you. as well as a book by two of our members, the North American Indians in early photographs. And uh, before I ask the final question, I'd like to remind our club members here today to be sure and vote in today's club elections. It's your right. And now, today's final question. What's the longest word in the English language, <laughs> and can you say it backwards? <laughs> That's funny. Thank you for this beautiful certificate and this lovely book. Blake is, uh, I think he's one quarter uh, American Indian, so he's going to be very interested in that. And uh, I shall enjoy reading it very much. Um, you all know what the longest word is. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't guess any of you could say it backwards. Uh, um, I, in fact, somebody came up with an even longer word, but I can't for the life of me remember who it was. I think somebody was trying to top it and actually did. But uh, anyway, f backwards, it's docius ali expiistic fragicali rupus. So how about that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make you say that. Is that all right? Yeah. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to uh, I just wanted to say that, that being uh, UNIFEM's Goodwill Ambassador is a pleasure. And I, I, I think myself privileged to have been here today. This really should have been Sharon's podium. But if, if I was able to bring her here and learn what I learned, I think it was worthwhile what I, doing what I did. But what she forgot to tell you is uh, uh, one of her greatest fears. And although it's uh, perhaps not the smartest thing to say, it's an, it's an interesting one. So when we have the women's uh, conference in, in uh, Beijing in 1995, uh, tell them what you told me, because I think it's interesting. Well, I, certainly one of the great fears that I have is that we'll have the women of the world uh, in Beijing once again discussing the obstacles that stand in our way. And the men of the world will be in New York restructuring the institutions of geopolitical and economic governance. So we have to do something about that. And I know Julie Andrews is going to help us do something about that. <laughs> because it's the United Nations uh, uh, right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for attending today's luncheon.